To me now, looking back on it, it was peaceful. Very seldom. Children used to fight and run through the alleys and jump fences. We had a double but door, very... but the outside was never locked. There were black families, there were Lebanese families. We didn't families, have a Chinese families at all times. And we so had... we related to everyone in the neighborhood. Everywhere you'd go, there'd be someone who knew who you were and where you were going and would report back well, to your mother. It and it made us all Your kids were my kids and my kids were your kids, so to speak. You couldn't you know. walk through the streets in the South End without saying hi yeah. 50 times. The church, of course, always played, played a very important part, as it still does today, in keeping the families... Well, well people did talk to each other and so forth. There was more, 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 more as a sort of you neighborhood. You had teachers who visited homes. <laughs> never mind calling, but who actually came yeah. into your house to talk to your mother about If you walked down Charlotte Avenue on a summer night, you wouldn't miss a word of Walter Winchell. Everybody's window was open. Everybody was out in the street, but everybody's window was open and the radio was on. Walter Winchell. Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. North and South American. All the ships and clippers at sea. Let's go to Boston, Massachusetts. The condition of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Jr., who was hurt today in a motor car crash near Walpole, Massachusetts, is not serious. In the mid-1800s, the elegant bow-front row houses of the South End were home to mostly middle-class and even some Brahmin families. But when the Cathedral of the Holy Cross was constructed on Washington Street, the Brahmins knew it was time to go. They headed for the Back Bay and Beacon Hill. Replacing them were the Irish. But since they couldn't afford to keep up the homes themselves, these new landlords turned the townhouses into rooming houses and change the landscape of the South End for the next hundred years. By 1900, the streets of the neighborhood resembled New York's Lower East Side. Working people of all races and religions, living side by side, all looking for what the South End had to offer, an affordable place to live. In the South End, you had a wonderful mixture of races and cultures and all kinds of people and all economic levels. I mean, there were, there were people living in single rooms and in little apartments and what have you, and there were people who lived in five-story townhouses as single homes. I remember by the time, what, I was six, seven years old, most of the kids, my peers, we could all swear in six or seven different languages, Greek, Armenian, Italian, uh, Irish, Arabic. So you had Near Eastern peoples, you had some blacks and, and whites, and had a variety of, uh, of, uh, of uh, incomes and so forth. That, that's, that's one of the characteristics of, of, of the area. People cared about one another. You knew the people next door, and you knew the people across the street, and if anybody was having a crisis, people tried to find a way to help. Somebody lost their job, and you know, people would arrive with casseroles and loaves of bread or whatever they were fixing for their family. If somebody got sick, one of your neighbors would come in and help to take care of them. If you weren't home and your children were, somebody scooped us up, <laughs> took us in. I mean, there was a much more uh, mutual support and concern, and you knew everybody. I mean, you knew everybody in the neighborhood, and they knew you. It was this everyday living that artist and South End resident Alan Kreit wanted to show in his paintings, some of which hang in the Smithsonian. I just want to show black people, just ordinary people, living ordinary lives, and, uh, and nothing more dramatic than that. Because I remember when you had the boat front houses all the way down. There's a reproduction of a painting done by Charles Haslam. He must have been standing right outside this house here. Looking towards, looking towards downtown. 
and uh, that gives you an idea what uh, what the South End was like. Fifty years ago, the South End had a large transient community living in cold water flats or walk-ups. But there was another way to live affordably and help pay a mortgage, by taking in rumors. We had a woman named Ethel Woods who lived with us uh, at one point for several years. Yes, a lot of people did that, especially uh, single women or single men were usually housed with a family more so than even than in rooming houses. There was an old Irish woman lived up in a small side room in our house and her name was uh, Mrs. Mrs. Cullane. Yeah. And next to her was an old German man who had really gone undercover during World War II uh, because his name was Julius Dinzer and he was very German looking and was very fearful. But when Mrs. Cullane died penniless in that room, and my family didn't have anything, Julius Dinza gave his grave to that woman. It was the most incredible thing. But a, how, a room, you know, a big room like this was a dollar and a half a week, and your small room was maybe 50 cents. If the idea of rumors sounds like a throwback, remember the weekly visits from the ragman, the knife sharpener, the ice man? From the West End to the South End, the sound of their carts on the cobblestones brought neighbors together, sometimes to bargain, sometimes to gossip. Any ice today, ladies? Any ice today, ladies? How about a little peace today? Don't you think you ought to? It's only for a quarter. How much is your box? How much do you need? Other lady next door, well, she likes it a lot. 50 cents that she would ask is not very much, but 50 cents a quarter. What's the difference, don't you order? How big is your box, my dear? I never heard that one. <laughs> well, they come down and uh, sell you a piece, 10 cents a piece, a quarter piece, you know, 35 cent piece, and um, people would buy there their ice and uh, for the, their ice box. Frenchie was very unhappy. My mother was one of the last ones to get a refrigerator. And he was very unhappy with her <laughs> when she finally did. He wouldn't talk to her for a long time. People who would go down the, the, the alleys, uh, hollering, eggs and box, rags and box. And he was, they were trying to buy rags and bottles. It was the first uh, effort to recycle. And <laughs> we had a nice box at that time, so he knew the size, and my mother would just let him in. We had a rag bin. He used to come in, and we had the bag out in the yard, and he used to weigh it and then give you a few pennies. The ice men would come along and holler ice, <laughs> and the ladies would stick their heads out the window and say, give me a five cent piece. <laughs> and the kids would chase the wagon and get all the chips, especially on a hot day, you know, they suck the ice. 